My Lords, virtual proceedings of the House of Lords will now begin. This is the first time that we will conduct question time in this way, as we would normally uh, in the chamber. I remind members that those these proceedings are subject to parliamentary privilege and what we say is available to the public, both in Hansard and to those listening. I would like to notify the House um, of and regret to inform them of the deaths of the noble Lords, Lord Gordon of Strathplane on March the 31st, of the noble Lord, Lord Armstrong of Ilminster on April the 3rd, and of the noble Lord, Lord Toombs on April the 11th. On behalf of the House, I extend our sincere condolences to the noble Lords, families and their friends. And I should also like to notify the House of the retirements with effect from March the 26th of the noble Lord, the Earl of Selborne, with effect from March the 27th of the noble Lord, Lord Steele of Aikwood, and with effect from April the 2nd of the noble Lord, Lord Brookman, pursuant to section one of the House of Lords Reform Act 2014. On behalf of the House, I should like to thank the noble Lords for their very much valued service to the House. My Lords, the virtual proceedings on all questions will now commence. I will call each oral question in the normal way. I will then call on the Minister to make the initial response. Uh, I will then call the Lord who has asked the question um, uh, to, uh, 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 to respond in the usual way. The Minister will again respond and I will then call in turn those Lords asking supplementary questions as listed on the speaker's list. Each uh, of the four questions will be given uh, 10 minutes um, each as laid down in the business of the House motion, which was agreed earlier this afternoon. So that we can fit in as many questions as possible, I would very much ask that questions and answers should be short. And I apologize in advance if it's not possible for everyone to be called. Please ensure that you're unmute um, uh, that you unmute your microphone prior to asking your supplementary question. Your microphone will be returned to mute when you have finished speaking. So in accordance with uh, guidance agreed, agreed by the Procedure Committee, if your name is not listed, not listed, it is not possible, I'm afraid, to ask a supplementary question nor take part in these proceedings. So having said that, my Lords, I call Lord Balfe to ask the first oral question. My Lord, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. Minister. Um, my Lord, I, I congratulate my noble friend on being the first to ask a question in the history of the House of Lords. Um, those who know me, my Lords, will realise it's the ultimate technological stress test uh, for me to get through it. Um, the government is grateful for the uh, work of the Lord Burns Committee, and I refer my noble friend to the former Prime Minister's response uh, in February 2018. Lord Balf, supplementary question? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm sure the House will agree, particularly at the moment, that we need to look to our reputation. And that that's not helped by the mass creation of new peers. However, no peer can be introduced to sit in the House without following the standing orders, and in particular Standing Order 112 of the 24th edition of 2015. It would seem that alterations to the normal procedure are achieved with the agreement of the House. So a resolution of the House to amend this resolution to reduce introductions to the number in the Burns formula would theoretically be the way to try and enforce this target set by Lord Burns. So new peers could be created, but they would have to wait to be introduced. I ask, would the Minister agree this matter could usefully be referred to Lord Burns and his committee to look at this suggestion as a way of bringing some discipline to the procedure? 
My Lords, um, it's not a matter for me to decide what should be referred to the committee. The size of the House is reducing uh, given uh, retirements and departures, of which we've sadly heard some today. But some new members are essential to keep the expertise and outlook of the Lords fresh. Lord Blake Cather, supplementary question. My Lords, may I first of all congratulate all of those in IT, the usual channels and the procedure committee for your tremendous achievement in making this possible in just two weeks. It is extraordinary. Thank you all. Now to my supplementary. Whilst I entirely support the two out, one in plan, if it fails to deliver for whatever reason, will my noble friend the minister not rule out other measures to reduce numbers, such as creating non-legislative peers who would not sit in this place, or looking at an age retirement point, or ejecting those who simply fail to participate in our proceedings above a threshold of, say, 25 or 30 percent of sittings in any parliament. Thank you. Minister? My Lords, the, my noble friend makes some concrete suggestions, as some would actually require legislation. Uh, the government's uh, view is that any reform of your Lordship's House would, would need careful consideration uh, and not be brought forward uh, piecemeal. Uh, so far as the uh, a minimum threshold on uh, participation is concerned, uh, I think many noble Lords feel it's not the quantity of participations that matter in this House, but their quality. Lord Burns, supplementary question. Right, I'll pass on. Baroness Taylor of Bolton, supplementary question. Sorry. Uh, can you hear me, Lord Speaker? Ah, Lord Burns, I recognise your voice. Is that right? Yes, it is. Yeah, Sorry. Right, go, on, go ahead. I just passed you on, but I, go ahead. I've got him. Um, I was saying I'm strongly in favour of the proposal, of course, of two out and one in, as it's an important part of the transition to a smaller house. But I'd also not like to lose sight of some of the other issues which the Lord Speaker's Committee felt were important for the longer term. Uh, we concluded that the hard work of getting the numbers down will be in vain unless a cap on the size of the house is maintained, and that the allocation of new members should reflect each party's electoral performance and their progress in achieving departure. Uh, does the Minister agree that without some combination of proposals like this, it is going to be difficult to see how we bring an end to the almost continual growth in numbers that we've seen since the 1999 Act. Well, my lords, the recent my lords, the recent history is not of uh, numbers increasing. As a matter of fact, um, I'd like to pay tribute, of course, to the noble Lord Lord Burns and his committee for the uh, inventive and constructive suggestions have made and the spirit with which many in the House are following them. But the longer term proposals, my Lords, of the committee to maintain a steady state size do require further careful thought and wider engagement, particularly with the House of Commons. And that was a point uh, made by uh, the previous Prime Minister. A Baroness Taylor of Bolton. I think we can take it. She's not there. Lord Tyler, supplementary question. My Lords, this requires a simple yes or no answer. For complete clarity, can the Minister tell us whether the present Prime Minister has committed himself to the same self-restraint of his predecessor in relation to the Burns Committee recommendations? My Lords, I don't normally respond with a, a pistol put to my head, but I have already said to the House that some new members are essential always to keep the expertise and the outlook of the Lords fresh. Lord Young of Cookham, supplementary question. And my Lords, further to the point which Lord Burns has just raised, he will know that a year after his original report, he produced a progress report, and that sent set benchmarks or targets for each of the main groups for the remaining years of the 2017 Parliament. Now, since then, we've had a general election. Would it, would it not make sense for that committee to be reconvened and set new benchmarks for the current part of the Parliament so we can see what progress is being made toward the target of 600? And does the government accept that 600 is a realistic target to aim for? 
My Lord's on, on the first point, in a sense, it's a matter for your, your Lordship's house. But of course, uh, we have had two follow up reports from uh, the noble Lord, Lord Burns and the Lord Speaker, which I think have been very informative and helpful. As far as a specific number is concerned, the previous Prime Minister did not commit to that, and uh, nor I think is this one. Baroness Hayter of Kentish Town, supplementary question. Um, in addition to the two out, uh, one in, there is the issue of the hereditaries, which have a different policy, which is one out, one in. Given that the Leader of the House got agreement before our, our recent recess, to postpone hereditary by-elections until September, would it now be possible to suspend all such by-elections as they arise? So at least we are working towards a, a two out, one in, rather than the hereditary system of one out, one in. No, my lords, this matter has been given extensive, I think, debate, extensive is a fair word in the context of the bill brought forward by the noble Lord, Lord Grocott. And the government's position remains that uh, reform of the House of Lords should be considered uh, appropriate um, at, at, at the due time and not conducted in a piecemeal fashion. My Lords, I regret the time allowed for this question has elapsed and I very much apologise to those members who were not able to ask their supplementary question. My Lords, we now come to the second oral question, Lord Hunt of King's Heath. My Lords, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. Anne Taylor is now exiting. Um, Senior Deputy Speaker. My Lords, a motion was agreed earlier today in the Chamber to enable certain items of business, including oral questions, such as this one, to be held virtually. The Procedure Committee met last week to agree and publish guidance on how these virtual proceedings will work in Stage 1. The Committee will meet again next week to discuss proposals for moving to more extensive virtual proceedings in Stage 2. Lord Hunt of King's Heath. My Lords, I'm very grateful to the Deputy Lord Speaker and to his colleagues and the staff of the House for everything they've done to make this possible. Uh, I hope it means that never again will Parliament be silenced for so long such, during such a critical time for our country. But can I ask him, in terms of the further work that's going to be undertaken, it is perfectly possible that many members of your Lordship's House will be excluded from attending Parliament for quite a long time into the future. If that is so, will the further work look at the possibility of members being able to vote in divisions online? My Lords, it would be wrong if people were excluded from a, taking part in the full membership and work of your Lordship's House, because in the public interest, they were remaining at home. Yep, Senior Deputy Speaker. This issue is one for the Procedure Committee and it will be informed by the views of members uh, of the committee and the usual channels. But what I can say uh, with confidence is that uh, the aim of having a virtual chamber means that everyone has to participate in the Parliament and that is very important. And if we have that as a primary objective, then I'm sure that Noble Lords uh, views and comments on that will be in accordance with the procedure committees. Lord Blunkett, some, a supplementary question. Lord Blunkett. Uh, I would like to uh, raise with the senior deputy speaker the whole issue of whether this is a means to an end or an end in itself, a means to ensuring that all members, wherever they live and whatever their circumstances, can continue participating rather than a Cromwellian move uh, to have a lockout where Parliament does not function at all uh, in terms of the Chamber for the foreseeable future. W would you be kind enough to reassure me that in the consideration of the development of stage two, a hybrid system might be developed so that we can move gradually out of the lock lockdown without ending up with a lockout? Senior Deputy Speaker. Uh, I thank the Noble Lord for his question and he has been in touch with me this week already 
on these particular issues. And I mentioned to him at the time and reassure him today that this is a temporary measure. The primary aim at the moment is to get that virtual chamber to ensure that every member in the House is able to participate to the same extent if they wish. Uh, the Procedure Committee met last week. It will be meeting again next week. And as Chairman of the Committee, I can assure the noble Lord that we will meet as and when. So the views of members is very important to me, very important to the committee, and I look forward to constant engagement with members so that we get this right. The primary aim, get the virtual chamber it now, and then we review it as we go along, informed by the views of members of the usual channels. Lord Newby, supplementary question. I think I was next on the list. You're so right. I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. Baroness Jones of uh, Malscombe, I do apologise for uh, cutting you Thank out. You. Thank you very much, Lord Speaker. And that, in, it, that is one aspect of the question I'm just about to ask. I, I would <laughs> like to emphasise um, Lord Hunt's point that remote voting is already done in other places. And so uh, I'm sure given the advances that we've made in the past two weeks um, into virtual sittings, I think remote voting has got to come to, to ensure that there is a democratic um, a part of the legislation that we pass. But I also wanted to mention there is a sort of uh, formula for allocation of questions and, and supplementaries and that sort of thing. And I'm sure you all know that the two Greens in the House are very enthusiastic participants in almost every aspect of the House. And I would hate to think that we were um, excluded by some sort of um, weird um, allocation of questions. Is that well, something the committee can look into? Senior Deputy Speaker. I'll answer those two points. Uh, Regarding Lord Hunt's point on remote voting, the House of Commons authorities are developing the functionality for remote voting, but the use of this would need to be approved by that House. The House of Lords could, if it desired, develop a similar platform. And due to the demands of the Parliamentary Digital Service, this would be at the expense of other work. And because of the current differences in technical platforms used by each House, it would take a number of weeks to develop. But I'm open to uh, the noble Baroness and others uh, to keep in touch with me on this issue. On the second point, I'm very much aware uh, from my conversations with her in the past that she wishes the Greens and the non-affiliated to get their fair share in this chamber of questions and others. And I will ensure that they do get that. There is not much in the Come guidance on. system at the Come moment that is clear Come for on. all, but the first step today will adapt and bring her point to the Procedure Committee. Um, Lord Baker of Dorking, supplementary question. First, many congratulations to the team that have made this technological advance available. This is a historic day because we have shown that you can hold a government to account, not necessarily by being present physically in a chamber in London. And whatever happens to our house, this will have some future in it. But the really exciting time is now question time. But here are we, 35 MPs participating together. There's no other event in this where I can see that can happen again in the technological future of the House. And so therefore, I th and, and, you know, that means 800 people have not had a chance to answer questions. And so I think the number of questions should be doubled to eight. And so you'll have more questions asked and you'll also have get more peers involved. I think question times becomes virtually much more important than it does actually physically. Senior Deputy Speaker. I agree with the Noble Lord on question time. The issue is scrutiny, and given the environment that we have today, scrutiny is extremely important, both for the House of Commons and the House of Lords. His suggestion about doubling the questions to eight, that is one issue that could be considered by the Procedure Committee. And at our meeting next week, I will uh, re-emphasise the point that the Noble Lord has made to me of that. And no doubt, if I meet him informally, he will give me some more advice as to what measures and what initiatives we can take in this area. Thank you. Well, Thank you. Lord, you be My Lord, I think it's already clear uh, from the questions asked that 
we're going to go into quite a long period during which a number of noble lords are not going to be able to attend the lords in person. Can I therefore reiterate my support for some of the suggestions already made in terms of a hybrid house uh, and voting remotely? But uh, my question to the uh, senior deputy speaker is, can he um, have as one of his principal aims to bring us into line with what the commons do so that we're on the same digital platform and that as they um, move to have virtual voting, which they're likely to do more quickly than us anyway, that we very much follow in their footsteps. Senior Deputy Speaker. Uh, I agree entirely with the Noble Lord and I have been privy to some of the information he, and the views he's had, had on this issue. The technical solutions which have been developed have been designed to meet the different requirements for each house, as he is aware. But I will certainly keep it as a primary aim to ensure that uh, the points that he has made here and in his communications with the administration of the Procedure Committee will be kept to the fore. And I could reiterate, the Procedure Committee will continue to meet as and when, because this is a fast developing situation. Lord Kirkhope of Harrogate. First of all, can I also congratulate everybody concerned with this effort on virtual uh, TV for us? But I'd like to ask the Lord Deputy Speaker if anything further can be done to aid those peers and peeresses who are currently unable to join the virtual proceedings due to technical or even broadband deficiencies in the places where they are currently locked down. I thank the Noble Lord for that question. Uh, he will be aware that there are two stages to this process. Uh, the first stage, stage one, is limited, as we know. That's limited to 50 today. Stage two, which we hope to implement uh, on 5th of May, will ensure a wider range of facilities, which includes live broadcasting. So as the technology allows uh, and the time passes, we will enhance the facilities that we have available to members so that we ensure, as I mentioned earlier, that every member has the same opportunity Participate in the house. Uh, Lord Carlisle of Beru. Oh, David Blunkett. Cousins is now exiting. It's, it's Lady Cousins next. Yeah. Lady Cousins. Oh, I see. Uh, yes, okay. Lady Cousins, I beg your pardon. Thank you. Uh, my Lords, is the senior deputy speaker aware that the Foreign Office Language School has used Zoom to deliver its language classes since the lockdown began? And as one of its language students, I found it very easy to participate, much easier than Teams. So could the Noble Lord say what the security or other concerns have been around this house using Zoom from the start? when it does appear to be acceptable both to the Foreign Office and indeed to the House of Commons? Uh, I thank the Noble Banners for her question. Uh, she may have heard me referring earlier to the House of Commons having precedence uh, on uh, taking up Zoom. Uh, so we have been behind uh, on that issue. But we have been advised by the experts uh, that uh, there are certain security questions. I don't think it would go through them here today, but I'm quite happy to write to the Noble Baroness uh, on this issue. And if uh, the Noble Baroness had heard the Lord Speaker on the Today programme this morning, uh, where he represented the House of Commons case uh, very, very well indeed, he did mention that we will uh, hopefully be eventually going on to Zoom on stage two. My Lords, I regret that the time allowed for this question has uh, now elapsed, and I'm uh, very much, I very much uh, uh, give my apologies to those um, who have been uh, cut out by that uh, time division. My Lords, we now come to the third oral question, Lord Naseby. Um, Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to ask a question standing in my name on the order paper. Minister. My Lords, the government takes fraud very seriously and we're commi committed to combating it. The City of London Police, National Lead Force for Fraud, has partnered with law enforcement and industry to combat call centre fraud from Ind India and other jurisdictions. UK authorities continue to work with their Indian counterparts on a case-by-case -case basis.
to target criminals responsible for defrauding members of the public and businesses? Um, it's the way I've lived. Question. I've lived, worked, and visited India, and I know, and both, I know both, both, both good and rogue centres there. there. The BBC, the BBC recently, recently exposed call centres that target, target UK elderly, elderly people, people, saying their computer their is computer frozen, is frozen and, and give them give a phone, them number phone number for technical, for technical support. support who will unfreeze in return for payment. These people are, are vulnerable currently in self-isolation. They're elderly people with no family support, and they're worried stiff that they will lose their only piece of visual communication and pay up. So will she urgently link up with the City of London Police Action Force and the National Crime Agency to put real pressure on the Indian Central Bureau for action on this matter. Minister, uh, I was going to say Patrick Williams of Trafford, but I didn't introduce you the first time. It's quite all right, Lord Speaker. Um, my, um, I thank my noble friend for that question, and he raises a very, very pertinent uh, point because I've had representation myself from older people worried about scams. Um, certainly in terms of our work with the India and the Indian government, um, the City of London police that he mentions, who are the lead force for economic crime, have partnered with law enforcement and industry to combat call centre fraud from India and other jurisdictions, as I said. For example, they've partnered with Microsoft, who have led industry efforts to combat this type of fraud. And as a consequence of that partnership, City of London Police has supported Microsoft in the initiation of a number of enforcement actions, um, the most recent of which has uh, occurred in the Kolkata uh, region. Um, obviously, things that happen overseas are a matter for the overseas authorities, but I will make the point that actually this type of fraud is global and quite often you cannot uh, trace from where it has originated. Uh, Baroness Wheatcroft, supplementary question. My Lords, last week I received an Outlook email which cited a password I have used, although not for the dubious purposes it alleged. If I paid $1,900 into a Bitcoin account, discretion was assured. Clearly, the attacker had accessed the passwords from one site and sent out a blanket blackmail attempt. Is the minister convinced that the platform operators are doing everything they can to detect the pattern of such blackmail attempts? I know that, um, that um, Lord Patel is now joining. My Lord, yeah, I know that, yeah, I know that law, law enforcement agencies are working extremely hard. And in fact, every day I'm on um, operational calls. Uh, with various law enforcement agencies. My mother actually had been uh, targeted by exactly the same scam uh, last week. Um, but uh, I know that the, the FCA have um, also conducted the uh, Scam Smart campaign uh, to raise awareness of this type of thing, particularly for, for pension and investment scams. A Baroness Neville Rolf supplementary question. I don't think she's here. Baroness Crawley, supplementary question. Um, Thank you, Lord Speaker, and well done, you. everyone, for getting us to this point. May I ask the Minister, given the rise uh, in COVID-related fraud and scams in the UK, where we know unscrupulous criminals are exploiting fears about the virus in order to prey on older and vulnerable people, as Lord Naseby has said, what is the government doing to ensure that local government capacity, especially in trading standards departments, is fit for purpose? And what direct enforcement action has the Competition and Markets Authority taken with those companies breaking the law? Um, I thank the noble lady uh, for that question. Um, 
she's absolutely right to, to raise this. Um, local government is often at the heart of some of that local uh, awareness raising and, in fact, enforcement action. I know that we have given um, uh, a grant uh, of um, half a million pounds, as well as an additional £600,000 for the National Trading Standards Scams Team to provide core blocking technology to vulnerable people. Uh, Lord Sharkey, supplementary question. My Lords, uh, yesterday the Times reported cybersecurity company Avast as saying scammers have been targeting healthcare providers worldwide since the pandemic struck. Their CEO said, we've seen an increased number of attacks against hospitals and the NHS is one of the top targets right now. Uh, these attacks are ransomware. They shut down NHS systems unless a ransom is paid. The last large ransomware attack on the NHS was in 2016 and led to disruption in at least a third of trusts. In 2018, the NHS published a lessons learned report which made 22 recommendations to protect against future attacks. How many of these recommendations have been implemented and how safe from ransomware attacks is the NHS at the moment? Um, I hope the noble lord will be understanding um, when I say that I haven't got every single detail um, on, on the NHS, but what I hope will help him, because I think it's pretty disgusting how this exploitation takes place very quickly on the back of vulnerable uh, events. But um, we know that court counter fraud guidance is being circulated alongside further advice and guidance by the Cyber Crime Protect Network, which consists of more than 100 police officers and staff across the country, whose focus is on helping businesses and individuals from uh, protecting the, the, themselves from these sorts of crimes. And of course, the public sector is a huge part of um, national business as we know it. But um, I've certainly had a lot of um, information on what just exactly how COVID-19 exploitation is taking place in terms of, I mean, selling people uh, protective equipment that is absolutely fraudulent, tests that are absolutely fake, um, is an appalling practice, but it is happening. Uh, and uh, we are working across agencies to try and combat it. Baroness Altman, a supplementary question. Baroness Altman. Okay. Um, Lord Speaker, and thank you to everybody who has made all of this possible. Um, much appreciated. I'd also like to declare my interest as listed in the register. Um, I would like very much to ask my noble friend a particular question on the issue of pension fraud, uh, pension scams. Uh, and I know the government has been doing a great deal of work trying to protect people better, but there are practical ways in which we can try and prevent money actually leaving pension funds. And so far, there's a ban on cold calling, but it isn't a, a complete ban. Uh, your provider can call you or others can call you. Um, and individuals are not clear where to report scams. There's Action Fraud, City of London Police, Project Scorpion, Scam Smart, the FCA, the Pensions Regulator. So I would be really grateful if my noble friend might um, ask the department whether on the issue of uh, pension fraud, there might be the possibility with our pensions bill going through at the moment to look more carefully at asking pension providers to clamp down on people who are in a rush to transfer quickly, direct people to pension wise uh, and perhaps help people protect their pensions with a line of defence at the provider level, because obviously we're not able to stop scams completely. These are very unscrupulous people who can change IP addresses and phone numbers and pretend not even to be in the country they seem to be coming from. Too long. Mm -hmm. um, my Lords, um, I certainly know that, um, sorry, I'm just looking for the appropriate bit here. Um, 
and I can't find it. Um, but but the noble lady uh, raises a very important point, and particularly at this point in time when people are feeling vulnerable, I think it's 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 a really pertinent time to raise that point. I will take that point back, and um, obviously I'm not in um, I, I, I'm not in the pensions uh, department, but I will take that point back and uh, alert my colleague uh, Baron Steadman Scott to it. My Lord, the time, I fear again, has uh, allowed for this question has elapsed. So we're going to have to move on with apologies to those who have not been able to make uh, to ask their question. We come to the fourth oral question, which is from Lord Fouts of Cumnall. My Lords, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. Minister Lord Bethel. Lord Bethel. Great. My Lords, our priorities are to save life and to protect the NHS. When the evidence demonstrates that it is safe to do so, we will adjust the lockdown arrangements. We have set out five clear conditions which need to be met. Adjusting the lockdown arrangements could involve relaxing measures in some areas, whilst strengthening measures in other areas. In formulating the right balance, we will be guided at all times by scientific advice and by the evidence. Uh, Lord Fouts of Cumnock, supplementary question. I'm grateful to the minister, but why does he and other ministers think that the British public are unable Unknown to deal with two messages exiting. simultaneously? Will the government now set out a plan for lifting the lockdown in stages when it's safe to do so in each area, just as is being done in other countries, and indeed is now being looked at by the Scottish government? Uh, the noble lord is, is right that the British public have been incredibly diligent, and I commend all of those who have followed guidelines to stay home for the impact they have had on the infection rate and on the mortality rate. However, we cannot fool ourselves into thinking that the epidemic is over and we have to be clear with the public and level with them that any changes in the guidelines are some way off and they will be presented to the public when our understanding of the medium term strategy is clear. Baroness Thornton, supplementary question. Yes, my lords. Um, Thank the noble lord um, for, uh, uh, for the answer you just gave, but I do think it begs the question that the government is still treating the British public like they are children. I'm sure that it would be possible to share your thinking even at this stage. The question I need to ask is about testing. Professor Paul Nurse, the director of the Crick Institute, said on the 19th of March that the way to deliver the vital testing to scale, and I quote, Institutes like ours are coming together with the Dunkirk spirit, small boats that collectively can have a huge impact on the national endeavour. Does the Noble Lord the Minister agree with this approach? Can the Noble Lord the Minister tell the House when the government will be able to utilise all the laboratory capacity, which will ensure mass testing and tracing and will speed up the likelihood of an exit to the current lockdown? Um, no, no. The noble baroness is entirely right. I have spoken to Paul Nurse and commend the Crick Institute for the work they have done to build up a remarkable 2,000 a day uh, test capacity. However, there are practical issues with the Dunkirk um, spirit. There are enormous logistical challenges for getting swabs and serology to laboratories. There are logistical problems with then registering the correct patient details and then getting the responses back. Where we have made substantial advances, and the Crick Institute have been pioneers in this, is in bringing industrial levels of organization, both to the very large numbers of tests that are done on each day, and to the logistical, logistical backbone that is necessary to process those results. A Baroness uh, Brinton, supplementary question. Yesterday, the World Health Organization said that COVID is not going to go away 
there isn't yet treatment or vaccine and we have to be a COVID ready society, they still say that any release of lockdown must involve test, trace and isolation. Can the minister say whether there will be enough local sources for testing, comprehensive tracing and arrangements for isolation ready prior to any lockdown in the United Kingdom? Minister? The noble baroness is entirely right. Tracking and tracing is going to be absolutely essential for keeping R0, the transmission rate, down when it does come to the implementation of our medium term strategy. We are working extremely hard to dramatically increase our testing capacity. And I can reassure the House that that capacity is growing enormously at scale and exponentially. And it is our expectation that it will easily meet the requirements of tracking and tracing. That tracking and tracing will be implemented by several work streams. The app, which has already been unveiled, will be an important part of that. So will the uh, PHE manual contact and tracing resources, and as will be use of any other technological advances and innovations that are developed as part of this response to the epidemic. Lord Mackey of Clashfern, supplementary question. Lord Mackey? Mackay. Mackay. You're probably not recognising my pronunciation. Lord Mackay of Clashfern. <laughs> Think that works either. Okay, we'll go on. Uh, Lord Patel, supplementary question. My Lord Speaker, you can't see me, but I hope you can hear me. We can. One of the, one of the five conditions that the government has set itself before any changes will be made to before the current lockdown is changed is that the government will have to be confident that there will not be a second wave of infection. So can I ask the noble lord, the minister, what scientific evidence will the government need in support of this decision? And what role would population-based serology testing play in this decision? Um, the, noble lord, lord, the noble lord, Lord Patel, asked an incredibly um, perceptive question. The ultimate decisions will be made by the CMO, who, as you know, has uh, enormous experience in this e exact area. Serology tests play an extremely important uh, role in this by giving an, uh, a, an indication of the amount of antibodies there are and therefore people who have a degree of immunity and therefore um, a sense of uh, how, how far the virus has spread through the community. However, we are aware that uh, reports are that um, there are recurrences of the virus in people who have who have emerged and recovered, and that puts a great um, uh, Lord sense Patel of concern about is our now exiting. Um, serology tests. Um, thank you, uh, Baroness Healy of Primrose Hill. Thank you. Would making face masks compulsory form part of the exit from lockdown strategy as other countries have implemented? Uh, the noble baroness is entirely right that the use of PPE, certainly in the workplace uh, and in more commonly in other parts of our life, are likely to be a part of our lives in in forthcoming uh, forthcoming period. However, to date. The British government has been sceptical about the efficacy of face masks and we do not want to be in a position of misleading or providing false reassurance for the public when there isn't sufficient scientific evidence of the use, uh, the, the, the um, relevance of face masks. However, should that evidence emerge and should the guidance change, then we will, of course, um, follow, the sci the fo follow the science and make the recommendation uh, if it is helpful. Uh, Lord Ravensdale, supplementary question. Thank you, Lord Speaker. Uh, oh, thank can you, you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Lord Speaker. Uh, the Noble Lord, the Minister, has talked about the, uh, the limitations of antibody testing in, this, in response to uh, the question from the Noble Lord, Lord Patel, that antibody testing could provide crucial information not only on the 
penetration of the disease within the population, but also its lethality, as well as how widespread asymptomatic cases are, complementing work being done in a number of other countries. So could the Noble Order Minister to update the House on, on what, what, what is being done in the UK on antibody testing at present? Yes, I, I, and and I, I, forgive me, my noble lord, but if the, the beeping of my computer distracted me from my last question, I didn't want to give the impression in any way that I was sceptical of the use of serology tests. Far from it. We are investing a huge amount of research uh, into serology tests of various kinds, whether both lateral flow and ELISA tests. Uh, we have been in touch with more than 180 providers of these tests, and the government recently uh, backed a British-based consortium that are developing a British lateral flow test, um, uh, which we have very high hopes and expectations of, um, with a view to potentially doing a very large amount of mass testing in this area in the months to come. But as the Noble Lord um, quite rightly uh, implies, uh, you do need a level of prevalence for uh, the antibodies for there to be accurate testing and for it to be useful. This is a, a a device that is very important to us, but one that we will use further down the road. And I'd be glad to update the House on the progress of our research as it develops. Uh, Lord Wrigley, supplementary question. Uh, my Lords, does the Minister agree that the best outcome by far would be for the unlocking to be simultaneous to the four nations of these islands? But would we also accept that that can only happen by the unanimous agreement of the four governments? And will you therefore confirm but there can be no question of areas ahead of the curve unlocking prematurely and putting in jeopardy the lives of citizens in those other areas which are behind the curve of, uh, of the pandemic's trajectory. Well, the Noble Lord is, is entirely right. And if I may take a moment to commend those colleagues from all of the nations who I've been working with uh, over the last month, one of the most singular and impressive aspects of the response to COVID has been the way in which the four nations have worked together. And I'm enormously grateful to my colleagues for the consistent, collaborative uh, and helpful approach that has been um, a, a characterization of this response. When it comes to geographical differences, that is the kind of subject that the CMO will give us advice on. Uh, it is, uh, of course, naturally um, uh, a, a huge amount of concern to that from those who might feel that they might be left behind. But the CMO will provide the best advice and we will follow the science in that matter. My Lords, I'm afraid that that uh, uh, means that the time allowed for questions has now elapsed. I would very genuinely like to thank all those who have contributed to this, the uh, first uh, oral question session by way of virtual proceedings. I think it shows, as uh, Lord Baker said, um, that uh, we can hold the government to account in different ways. Doubtless we will get better at it as the uh, uh, weeks go past, but I think this was a very uh, um, important um, beginning, and I think the information uh, that uh, came out was also uh, very valuable. So thank everyone very much. Apologies for those who, uh, who couldn't get in, but that brings the virtual proceedings uh, to an end. Thank you so much.